Let's begin then. Oh, hello everyone and thank you all very much for being with us this afternoon. My name is Natcha and I am here today with my colleague Ju Kai. We are PhD students in the Department of Architecture at Cambridge University. For those of you who haven't been with us before, this research seminar is hosted and supported by the Martin Center for Architectural and Urban Studies. This is a research arm of the Department of Architecture at the Cambridge University. Today, we welcome you to the fifth seminar in Easter term. This is the 51st annual series and it is themed around the discussions on architecture and energy. Our speaker today is Dr. Ken Yang, who of course is no stranger to many of you in the audience. It is our pleasure and our honor to be able to, doc to welcome Dr. Uh, Dr. Yang to de deliver today's lecture. Now, onto some quick housekeeping before we properly begin. The talk will be about um, 40 minutes and then we'll be, we will open up the floor to questions. If you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box. Or if you can wait until the end, you could virtually raise your hands by clicking the hand button on, on the bottom of your screen. And then we will invite you onto the panel and then you can switch your video, your microphone, and you can talk to the speaker directly. This is a lot more interactive. And so if you could do that, that's so much more preferred. I should also make it clear that the webinar today is being recorded, but this will be stopped as soon as the questions and answers starts. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my colleague to introduce our speaker. The floor is yours, Kai. Uh, thank you, Nacha. And I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank Dr. Ken Yan uh, for coming here in the Martin Center Research uh, Seminar today. Uh, as one of the graduate students in the Martin Center, uh, I have been reading many of Dr. Kenyon's work uh, about the green design, uh, especially the design for resilience based on science of ecology, just as stated in the topic of today's lecture. Now I'd would like, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker to our online audiences, including those who are not specialized in this field. Uh, Dr. Kenyon is both an architect and an ecologist. Uh, he's the executive director at T.R. Hamza and Yan in Malaysia. Uh, his ecological architecture and the eco master plans have a distinctive green aesthetic, which are beyond the conventional accreditation. He trained at the Architectural Association School, followed by the, uh, followed the doctorate uh, on ecological architecture and planning at Cambridge. He has authored over 12 books on green architecture. The Guardian newspaper once named him as one of the 50 people who could save the planet. His rationale is that the planet's ecology is the final environmental baseline upon which all humanity's activities take place, where their negative impacts affect the planet's health. In today's lecture, Ken will discuss the ecocentric approach that redefines designing the built environment as applied ecology. That's me at the end of the introduction. So I will now hand over to Ken. Ken. Great, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I'm delighted to speak um, to all of you. Um, my topic as mentioned uh, is designing for a resilient planet. And if you read the background literature to climate change and, and the uh, COP21 in Paris, it will become clear to all of you that we don't have very much time left, maybe about 20, 30 years. And um, well, I might be pushing daisies by then, but um, for all of, the, all of you young people, my hope is with you. My biggest disappointment is the way that architecture has still been taught and that I believe that we should all learn ecology and because that changes the way you look at the world, changes the way you design, changes the curriculum of schools of architecture. So I hope that um, something will be done. Now, I can't change it. Okay, um, this summarizes basically my method of work because my research, as you know, is on ecological design and planning. And then um, I sit down and discuss with my colleagues what are the general concepts and uh, specific concepts and design systems and technical devices and 
and then our project, then we imp, uh, interpret these ideas and, 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 and concepts in our design projects and we get them built um, and not all of them because, uh, you know, practice isn't as straightforward as, as it is, um, as appears to be. And so we test out ideas with built systems and sometimes <laughs> we're inhibited by the client. And, and then when our project's finished, we evaluate it, we evaluate the outcome and then from there produce my publications. So, and then the publications then, while sorting out the publications, um, it gives us the opportunity to identify further research. And so we go back to do more research. So it's, if you like, this is a psychic process we go through. Now I'm going to discuss three design principles that guide and drive our work. One is on ecocentricity, the second is biointegration, the third is ecomimicry, and the fourth is eco-infrastructure. Ecocentricity is based, essentially designing based on the science of ecology. And um, second, biointegration uh, is, um, is about a synergistic fusing, fusing of constituents. And then the third is um, eco-mimicry, which is the mimicry of ecosystem attributes. And the fourth is eco-infrastructure, which is about the key ecological infrastructures, which need to be biointegrated together. So I'm going to uh, you know, um, discuss these in greater detail as I go along. Now, um, ecocentricity is the science of ecology as the basis for designing, making, operating, regenerating, and reintegrating our built environment. Um, now, everything starts with the biosphere. The biosphere is this thin film which is, surrounds the planet, and this is where all organisms live. Uh, within the biosphere are the biogeochemical cycles. I'm sorry for the wrong mistake. Um, there's energy and material resources. And of course, within the biosphere, there are ecosystems which are units in nature. And so bios the biosphere consists of a number of organic and inorganic um, constituents. Essentially, it consists of communities of plants and animals and the physical environment. The community of plants and animals is the biological constituents or the biotic constituents. And the physical constitu uh, constituents are the abiotic constituents. Now, within this scheme of things, there's us as human being. We are obviously part of the communities of plants and animals, but we're very different. You know, we're the most powerful of all species as we're able to, you know, change landscapes, change waterways, you know, de deforest the planet. And now uh, we're going to, we are, we are, we are so significantly changed the, the planet's climate. And that, you know, there's projected that hopefully by year, in 30 years time, uh, the climate, uh, the climate increase, the, the increase in temperature of the planet would not exceed 1.5 degrees, but it's likely it will. And then we, as of, as as a biotic constituent, as a, one of the organisms in in the planet, make things. We make more things than any other species in nature. We, in fact, we um, you know, we contaminate the earth with things. Now, the, bio, the built environment in this context is, refers to not just um, buildings, but refers to cities, urban areas, transport stations, uh, transport station systems, structures, artifacts, and even food. And so, if you like, the, the relationship between the biosphere and our built environment is that the built environment takes in inputs from the biosphere <coughs> and discharges output. And if you articulate this a little bit more, then inputs consist of energy, water, materials, food, including people. And then outputs would be energy, materials, people, the built system itself, built system itself, at the end is was used for life. And the built environment has three levels of impacts. The first impact when it's made, operation impact when it's uh, being used, and there's the end impacts uh, at the end of useful life. So now, what happens is that the outputs that we throw away to, into the environment gets thrown back into the biosphere. You know, we talk about throwing things away, but there's no away. 
the away is the biosphere itself because you know the earth itself is the closed system. And so as we continue to make things, can continue to throw, uh, make emissions, we throw away rubbish, throw away plastics, we contaminate and the very, <clears throat> the, the very environment that we live in. And so that is the cause of the environmental degradation. So now we need to biointegrate. The principle of biointegrate is that if we're able to biointegrate everything that we make and do with the environment, in a seamless and benign way, there won't be any environmental issues. And so cr the crux of ecological design is effective biointegration. And biointegration is both physical and systemic. Now, I draw an analogy between what we do and what doctors uh, medical, in, the, in the medical field do with prosthetic devices. A prosthetic device is something that is artificial. It is synthetic, it is human made, but it's attached to a host organism, organism, which is the human body. Now, everything then depends on effective integration of the prosthetic device with the host organism. Now, if it's not effective, then either the prosthetic device breaks down or the host organism is hurt. And so that is the principle of prosthetic devices. Now, by analogy, our built systems, our technology, our artifacts, our semi-artificial systems are prosthetic devices. They are artificial, it is human made, it is synthetic. So then the question is, what is its equivalent host organism? It's very simple, the host organ equivalent is the biosphere itself. So then everything depends on effective integration of our built systems with the host organism being the biosphere. If it's not effective, that's then that's impairment to the environment happens. And so for effective biodegradation, if building this environment must become part of nature, now it's alienated from nature. Look at the room that you're in at the moment. It is different, it's separate, it is isolated from nature. And my thesis here is that the built environment must, must become a human-made ecosystem. So that leads me to the third point, which I call ecomimicry. And that our built environment needs to be remade to become part of nature. And mimicry basically means emulating, replicating, and augmenting ecosystem attributes uh, into the built system. And this is very important. And I just want to emphasize this because if we don't emulate and replicate and augment ecosystems, um, we then becomes alienated, alienated from nature by alienation. Uh, we, you know, then it contaminates, it affects, it changes, radically affects the natural environment. And that this is when um, the impacts affect every aspect of our lives, expect the air, expect, uh, affects the water, expect the land um, that we uh, live in. So I started to do research on ecosystem attributes that we need to emulate. So here's a, a, a list, it's not a complete list, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a partial list. We have to emulate ecosystems, biological structure, biodiversity, connectivity and nexus, provision ecosystem services, biointegration, responsiveness to climate, use and cycling materials, hydrology, symbiosis, hemostasis, food production, and succession. So there are other aspects, but the, these are some of the key ones that I can identify. So let me start with the first attribute, which is the biological structure. Now, I already mentioned that uh, the, the uh, nature, the ecosystem consists of biotic constituents and abiotic constituents. And the key is, you know, if we integrate the human, uh, human society with nature, then the idea was that the, the built environment that, that results is a hybrid ecosystem. So by bringing these two together, the human communities and abiotic constituents, um, we create what we call, um, sorry, this, that was the wrong slide. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we, the idea was to make cities and uh, buildings and structures uh, into um, constructed ecosystems. 
Now, I'll start to look at patterns of introducing biotic constituents into the built environment. So the upper row of patterns would be, for instance, the first one is where we put everything, all the biotic constituents in one location. That's in Central Park in New York. The second is a dispersed planting spotty pattern. That's in Georgian London, where you have a series of green squares, Bedford Square, Euston Square, Russell Square, Tavistock Square, and so forth. The second, third is a stepping stone relationship where the patches of greenery are close to each other but not connected. And the fourth is the one where the, the uh, vegetation connected and not that you have a series of ecological corridors and ecological fingers. The bottom row shows the equivalent uh, with buildings. You can either put all the greenery at the biotic constituent in one location, or second is one of intermixing where you use the patchy relationship. The third is the stepping stone relationship. And the fifth, the fourth is the uh, integrated where the vegetation connected. Now, ecology sees the last one as preferred because by being connected, um, there is greater mobility interaction between the species of both flora and fauna. And that by being connected, there is a greater pool of natural resources to be shared among the species. By having a larger pool of resources, it engenders a much more stable. Uh, ecosystem, and therefore it is the preferred pattern. And of course, we should need it, need to integrate both to the hinterland as well as you know to the lowest parts of the building. This is a scheme that I did back in um, 2099 for a competition scheme in Singapore. We didn't win the competition, but the idea uh, competitions for us are, are, I feel like, opportunities to do research and experiment. And so for this building, I had a ramp, a vegetated ramp that goes all the way up the building. So these are a set of plans. The vegetation winds its way up to the right to the top of the building. And that um, the, then I thought that as you reach a certain level where it is the same level as the roofs of the joining buildings, you can then bridge across the roof and, and green the, that building as well. And so eventually this becomes the catalyst for um, for making the city green. The second, uh, the, um, so the second property attribute is biodiversity. And um, now nature is very diverse, whereas our human systems are simplified systems. You know, if you look into the building that you're in, then you realize that, you know, there's the only biotic constituents is you and you and the bugs and the germs. So where's the other constituent? So one of the things I start with, wherever I do a project is to look at this diagram, if you like, it's an indication of the level of biodiversity of the location. So UK is about 52 degrees above the equator and you can see it is not that biodiverse compared to what it is in the equator, like in Singapore or Malaysia, which is about, um, you know, point one, you know, one degree about the equator. And so our work design works then starts with creating habitats within built environments. Habitats could be green roofs, vertical green, green sky cores, green atriums, green areas uh, at ground level, the green links to the hinterland. And, you know, and the, the last is the eco cell, which is an invention that we, um, that we started to develop some years back. And so the, the, if you look into the left-hand column, these are the benefits. It, it, it reduces the um, city's heat island effect, enhances the local biodiversity, it sequests um, the greenhouse gases, um, it enables it has biophilic um, uh, uh, benefits to humans, and improves the um, microclimate of, of the facade and um, at the edges of the building and uh, reconnects fragmented um, habitats. And so these are some of the benefits. And so that's what we do. When we design, we say, we ask, where are we going to put the benefits in the building and which part of the building, which, where are we going to locate the habitats in the building and, where, and, and how we're going to design these habitats. This is a project that we finished about um, a year and a half ago. And the white squares 
show where the habitats are on the on balconies in the building in in the roofs and underground. Um, and right hand side of this diagram are the different types of habitats. We have a landscape promenade, landscape balconies, the green ground patches, and uh, an external landscaping ecocell. The building is that shape is is like two 15, 16 story building buildings which um, which are separate from each other because of this axis between the monument by the waterfront uh, and the square. And so um, that, you know, that's the urban design explanation for the building. And in between two buildings is this promenade, uh, which, which have seating areas, which have planting. And above the, um, on the facade of the building are the um, balconies and, and the green balconies. So basically the two axes, the main axis, which is the one on the right hand side, which is the boulevard that leads to the prime minister's residence. And then the second axis is from the square, the sort of circular, you know, the roundabout that goes all the way down to the uh, monument. So this, uh, this plan shows it more clearly, the central axis to the prime minister's residence and the secondary axis to the monument by the waterfront. Prime minister's residence is the one, is the image on the right hand side. So with this project, um, we started to locate habitats, and these are different habitats in the building form. The two buildings are almost symmetrical, they're like chevron shape, but not exactly symmetrical. They're asymmetrical because of the shape of the site and the dimensions of, of the site. And so we prepare what we call a biodiversity matrix, a biodiversity target matrix. So as you can see on the left hand side in the red box, that's the first thing we do. We create habitats within our development. And secondly, we identify native fauna that we want to bring back to the site that is not hazardous for human beings, whether for feeding, for breeding, or for refuge from prey. Having identified the fauna, that becomes the, the, the left hand axis. We try to that we then identify the flora that will attract the fauna. And having identified that, we then integrate the, all them together and look at where they interact for each of the habitats. And that provides the basis from which we design uh, the habitats and the landscape components. So this is, if you like, the ecological biodiversity approach um, in which, which differentiates what we do from other architects who just put you know, vegetation in the buildings. Most architects put vegetation buildings as, as decorative device, you know, uh, items which is actually uh, you know, um, uh, you know, an anathema to, 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 um, to an ecological architecture. So here it is, you can see the axis, you can see the Millennium Monument, which is that spire at the, at the bottom of the waterfront, which was also designed by us about eight years earlier. And then there's the roundabout, and then um, there's the famous bridge, beautiful bridge, which is, um, uh, which uh, is a copy of what Color Travel does. And in plan, you can see the access down to the monument and around the monument are the uh, Ministry of Finance buildings and the waterfront uh, in front of it. We wanted to shape the building so that it is, we, you know, we depart from the conventional orthogonal modernist building. And so it is faceted and and then where there are, where it facets, um, we, we, you know, we punch holes to create balconies and terraces that people from inside the building can actually go out into the open air. And then along the uh, folds of the, of, of the facets, we would slice it, you know, to, to, uh, so that this articulates the facade. The pattern we use is actually a double skin wall and the outer wall is glass panels with, uh, with a fitted, white fritted pattern. And uh, in Malaysia, the cultural identity is extremely important. So we took the pattern from a, a, a woven cloth called Songket, and that is the uh, Malay cultural identity to the building. And this is what the pattern, the, uh, the fritted glass looks like on the left hand side. It's not like butt jointed, they are separated you know, by a few inches so that hot air can go out and then the second image shows what it looks like from inside the building. And then on the right hand side is the, the structure that supports the outer glass panel. 
and that that's the passageway for servicing um, uh, the uh, for cleaning the inner 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 facade and cleaning the outer facade. Now the uh, energy intensity is 136 kilowatt hours by 18 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum, whereas an average office building in the tropics uses about 210 to 250 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. And so in that sense, we are about 70% less than what is, um, you know, what is the baseline, um, baseline energy consumption. Then on the west side of the building, we angle the facade a little bit so that it uh, addresses the western sun. And this is what the western facade looks like. And we have more balconies you know, facing the, the, that side of the building. And then uh, we start to look into ways in which we could bring the greenery continuously from the, uh, from the building, from the third floor down to the, not just to the ground floor, but all the way down to the uh, basement levels. And so this was an idea that we start, we developed about, um, about 10 years earlier. This, what you see here is the master plan we did for competition for Kowloon Waterfront, uh, which we did win. Um, but the idea was to have voids that we cut on the podium that goes all the way down into the lower, lowest parts of the building and we bring vegetation and we bring um, various um, climatic factors, aspects into the uh, insides of the building. One of the ideas we had for this master plan was to have what we call pier towers, towers that uh, sits on piers that stick out in the waterfront. So you can see the pier towers on the left hand side and on the right hand side of this plan. And then the roof extends across to the rest of Hong Kong Island. And so you can see the, the ecological bridge on the right hand side. And so these eco cells do for five things. The, it gives opportunity for vertical integration of greenery, provides opportunity rainwater harvesting, provides natural ventilation, brings daylight. And at the bottom of the eco cell, you can put um, an eco machine like the one that invented by John Todd, or you can put a bioswale. And so for this project, you can see the vegetation goes all the way down in a ramp down to the you know, lower parts of the building. And that this is what it looks like as the, um, as the vegetation weaves this way down when it reaches the ground floor to the basement level. Now, I showed earlier on you know, the, the, um, the habitats we create the building, uh, we create with a medium rise building. Next question then is how do we apply this to the high rise? And so this is a project that, um, that is now under construction. Uh, it's, it's a 35, 36 story building. Um, we start by doing research on the surrounding ecological context. And from there, we, we, our site is that little red dot. And that gives us um, clues on what vegetation we want to bring back in, what fauna we want to bring back into the uh, locality, and what fauna we should use. And so again, this is the uh, habitat diagram. Um, in the building, we have habitats, which is on the ground level, habitats in this green wall, habitats in the green cord, habitats in the, on the uppermost level. And that um, the species we want to bring, that we want to attract this time is um, dragonflies and butterflies at the lower floors, songbirds on the middle floors, and migratory birds on the upper floors. And so if you like, this is the biodiversity matrix for a vertical building. The next of, uh, attribute is eco ecosystems, connectivity and nexus. And so going back to this earlier diagram, the idea of ecological um, nexus is that we would have an ecological corridor if you like in as much as we can, if it's a plan, and we have ecological fingers that eat into the urban areas, and with the uh, with the with the with the, with, the, with the building, it would, would then spiral it and continuously wrap it around the building to go all the way up to the roof of the building, uh, to be interconnected and 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 to be linked. And so, this is a concept drawing we did, uh, where we show that yes, we need to link the city, all the green areas in the city together. So when people ask me, if you were to green a city, what would you do? Well, the first thing I would do would be to try and link all the green areas together, you know, Regent's Park to Hyde Park, to all the green areas in the city, 
will be extremely difficult. You know, we have to use eco bridges and eco undercrofts, but that's the whole idea where we balance the biotic with the abiotic. Then when we reach the building, then we should go up the building continuously, not just at the ground level, but up to the top of the building. So this is the idea, this is the concept uh, that, you know, uh, of what an ideal eco cities should be. So back to this building that we I showed earlier on, uh, where the vegetation climbs all the way up to the top of the building. Um, this was, well, I think I did this back in 19, 19, um, 1999. And so it wasn't until um, 2006, 2007 that we finally got the opportunity to, to implement this idea. Um, this is a concept drawing. So this time we put a walkway next to the vegetation, the ramp, so that people can service and can walk around the building uh, without going through the uh, usable areas, uh, user areas. And so this was a concept drawing showing uh, the vegetation as a ramp, uh, uh, a planter box, and that with the um, walkway on the side of it. And so this is here, it is as completed. You can see the walkway, people walking around the vegetation, sun shading on top and the uh, glazing of the building on the right hand side. Now, um, the idea was that as we ramp up the building with every facade, we climb a floor. And so this way, the uh, vegetation, you know, you know um, weaves its way up the building. And then I call, we start to call this a park in the sky because, you know, it is all linked and people can walk. And if you stretch it out, it's about 1.3 kilometers long. So it is um, a very it's a linear park. And this is what it looks like in certain parts of the building. And that um, from a distance, you can see how it climbs a floor. The building on the far left is a building designed by the famous um, uh, Japanese architect, Kisho Kurukawa, um, who's my friend actually. He, um, I, I invited him to speak at Cambridge at University School of Architecture uh, back in 1970. And that uh, this is in the uh, uh, one north district of Singapore. And here's the actual building itself. And this is the vegetation that climbs up to the top of the building in a continuous way. This is one of the uh, landscape bridges, uh, landscape ramps on the facade of the building. And that, well, to, to, to avert the boredom of a linear park, at corners, uh, some of the corners, I would open it up to create terraces. I call them some mini plazas or pocket parks. And so that, you know, it's, it's, that's a ramp and then it opens up to the park into little plazas and then it goes, goes around the building again, looking its way up to the top of the building. And so you see this square here, uh, in the, and these are the floor plans of the building. And that the shape of the building and the shape of the site uh, was given by the original master planner who is Zaha Hadid, and she, um, she, you know, she basically she set the uh, the, the building limits and building constraints and and the and the built form limitations to the building, and the red squares here um, shows the uh, the terraces and the balconies to the building, and you know on the right hand side is one of these um, balconies. People can actually go out and you know have a puff and a cigarette, or they have the lunch or the breakfast, or you know, or tea. Uh, and so it's it's a nice shaded, pleasant space um, between the inside of the building and the outside of the building. <coughs> we <coughs> we adopted the idea for a, for a complex. You know, we work in London, so we have a series of interwoven, interweaving uh, balconies and and sky courts. Now the, the building is actually the project is actually two buildings which are linked by uh, bridges. And so um, this is the south side of the building next to green. I should have linked the green in the building to this patch on the ground, but at that time I didn't have the opportunity to do it. At the mid level, I have a roof garden. Uh, this is at the mid level roof garden. And then you can see the, the view of the building from the top. I'm sorry, it's not a very clear um, uh, slide, but you can see the sky courts on the bottom. You can see the mid level garden. And then there's the rooftop garden um, where people can actually sit and it gives a terrific view of the environment uh, and the surrounding um, urban scape. Now in Singapore to, to get uh, a rating, 
um, uh, one of the criteria is what they call it the green criteria where um, the, the greenery in the building um, has to be more than the greenery on the ground that, that it sits on. And so the minimum criteria is six, whereas in this project with the spiraling landscaping, um, we reached 12.2. So we almost double what is required by the authorities uh, to, to achieve a, a platinum rating. And, and this is very important because, you know, even though you, whether you work, uh, you, uh, you know, with Briam or work with LEED, um, these are just guidelines. We should exceed it as much as we can. And so, um, the buildings actually consist of two separate blocks, A and B, linked by this uh, in, the, in, the, in the skin, and in between is an atrium. And so here, just looking up at the atrium, atrium is the glass roof. The glass roof is operable, so that on a normal day, a hot air can go out, but if it rains, it is it has sensors that autom automatically shuts it. And so here's the atrium, here's the glass roof on top of it. But on a normal day, it just opens up so the hot air can go out. And then um, the two blocks are linked by a, a bridge. And so this is a bridge that links the two blocks. And this is the bridge seen from the inside of the building. And this is the view from the atrium looking out um, to the external wall. But one of the experiments we uh, did with this project is what we call a diagonal light shaft, where we cut, uh, cut a void going all the way down uh, the floor down to the street level and on the right hand side is the view of this of the shaft from the lower floors and this is looking down to the street level and so this enables this opportunity to bring daylight into the inner parts of the building but it's it's an experiment it's not 100 percent effective and that you know the, you know the, where you see on the left hand on the plan is the rectangle is the uh there's the light shaft on the right hand side is the simulation of the daylight intensity and you can see the floor plan is basically too deep, and that's a defect of the scheme. But we had to meet the the required floor area uh, required by by the by the uh, by the client. So we had to end up having um, having uh, fairly deep floor plates. But we could obviously have um, have a much more peripheral. Um, uh, uh, usable spaces, just like in Germany, where in Germany, no dust is permitted to be more than seven meters away from the from the external glass wall. So most office buildings in Germany are either 15 to 18 meters from glass to glass. Now this is looking up from the street. You can see like it goes right to the top of the building and, and, and you can see the, uh, the atrium roof on top. So back to the eco cell idea, um, and we had the eco cell here and it's located this part of the floor plan. And here it is, it weaves its way up, going all the way down to the, to the basement level. The next um, property that we should try and emulate, uh, emulate and uh, replicate uh, is ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is a term that came out, that ecologists came up with in the year around, around 2000 to describe things that nature does for the planet without human intervention. And so these are the things that nature does for us. It produces oxygen and it maintains the biological and genetic diversity, purifies water, um, the storage cycling and global distribution of fresh water, regulates chemical comp composition. That's a whole list of aspects, you know, that nature does. Now these are done by nature for us, for the planet, without human intervention. It's a massive task. We should be thankful for nature, but they're not all visible. And so unless you're an ecologist or, or a natural, you know, environmental naturalist, naturalist, um, you wouldn't be aware of what's happening. And so, um, you know, things that happen outside the room that you're in is a lot more complex than you think it is. And, and that these are amazing things that, that the planet does, that we're not aware of. Now, back to my idea that we should try and mimic these then you suddenly realize that it is impossible. There's no way we can mimic the production of oxygen to extend that nature does. There's no way we can um, produce um, energy the way in you know, the photosynthesis the way the extended nature does. And there's no way we can 
sequester and toxify human industrial waste uh, add to the level that nature does it. And so what do we do? So is this just a pipe dream to say, you know, to, um, to imitate and to uh, emulate uh, nature, one of these nature, one of the properties of nature? And so we thought and thought and thought, well, we thought that maybe the solution is not so much to, um, not to, uh, not to imitate 100%, but make use of nature, augment the built environment with nature. And so we suddenly came up with the idea that we should weave nature into our urban environment. That means, you know, just like, you know, uh, two class hands, the one finger, one set of fingers will be nature, the other set of fingers will be urban environment. And that we have an equal corridor that connects all these together. And then we equal fingers that they weaves into the built environment and goes into the, um, goes into the hinterland. And so this was the master plan for, uh, uh, for a site in uh, in the Reunion Island, which is east of Madagascar, um, the Reunion is, is is you know it's French territory, and you can see the shapes of the urban fingers, and you can see the shapes of the uh, the vegetated fingers, and so that they are so close together, or not so close together, close enough, so that the ecosystem services <coughs> from the green areas benefits the urban areas. We decided, we did some studies and we thought we experimented and that the urban fingers would be about 30 meters maximum. And then the, the green fingers could be about 20 meters. And so in this way, as against, let's say in London where Hyde Park is miles away from Hackney or, or uh, Regent's Park is miles away from, uh, from, the, uh, from the bottom of London. And so this is the area view of the development. You can see that nature coming all the way up from the waterfront. We have a finger, uh, ecological finger corridor that picks up all the vegetation, brings it all the way up to, you know, to the inner parts of the island. And then the urban area goes all the way down. So this was the idea that we can, yes, we cannot imitate nature. We can imitate nature's abilities to provide ecos ecosystem services, but we can augment the built environment with nature in close proximity so that the ecosystem services provided by nature is cheek by jaw with the urban areas. And we're trying to avoid, you know, pristine edges because, you know, species preferred, you know, uh, um, curvy, you know, a sort of fuzzy, uh, um, curvy linear edges. So there are places to hide, uh, places to breed and so forth. So the next uh, uh, aspect is eco-infrastructure. This is then another idea that we had that ecological design is a seamless and benign biointegration of a series of infrastructures. The infrastructure is nature itself, which is um, itself considered regarded as infrastructure, the hydrology of the natural environment, which is regarded as uh, infrastructure, um, the built systems itself, and human society. And so all these four components are. Um, are key infrastructures that need to be woven and bound to create together. So the first one is nature itself as an infrastructure. The second is water, the hydrologic, hydrological regime. Um, uh, and then the third is our human society, our social, economic, political, and, and other institutions. And then the fourth is our built environment, you know, the structures, you know, and the infrastructure is both external. So these are, you know, external, but obviously within buildings, the uh, utilities within the building itself is the infrastructure, but it's hidden because it hid, you know, uh, we hide it within the walls and within ducts and, so, and um, in the floor. And so these are different components of each of these infrastructure. And so ecological design is by integrate all these four into a whole. Now, obviously that is, this is the challenge of ecological design. This is easier said than done. But that is what ecological architecture should be. That means we biointegrate synergistically, bi synergistically biointegrate nature with um, our built environment, with our human society, and with the hydro hydrology of the locality. Now, you know, infrastructure then should drive what we do. And so if the existing city would have existing infrastructure and buildings attached to it. 
but the infrastructure of the existing city isn't green. And so a lot of architects, when they put green buildings in the city, they have to connect to some extent to the existing infrastructure, but you can never make a city green that way because um, you know, it's only partially effective. So the most important idea I want to leave in your head is that we should start by making our infrastructure green and anything else we put into connected infrastructure um, you know, makes it easier to, to green the whole city. And so if it, it went, so when you talk to a green designer, the first thing you need to ask them is where does the energy come from? Where does the water come from? Where does the sewage go? Um, and and where does the, what's the telecommunication systems that you use? These itself should be green. So ecological design should start with making the infrastructure green and not just doing individual green buildings. And so back to the idea of the infrastructure, I color code them, I call nature infrastructure as, uh, as I was a spelling mistake there. The green, the human is red, because it's the color blood, the water in, the, in uh, to be blue and eco-technology and our built environment is gray. This, this is a master plan that we did in, uh, in Bangalore. On the right hand side of the site, which is the Western side, uh, is the forest reserve. So the idea then was to collect all the best species in the ecological spine. Then we stretch it across the site as you would, you know, stretch a strip of chewing gum. And then we're trying to link it to the adjoining site so that we can try and interconnect as much of the, uh, the plots as, as possible. This is the master plan for the scheme. And you can see the green infrastructure, uh, which is the, the, you know, which is green colored. And that's a spine and we brought it across the site. And here it is stretching across the other end. So this is a green infrastructure for this particular master plan. And so in our designing, you know, with master plans, uh, we start with the green eco infrastructure. And from there, then other, other infrastructures, you know, uh, are added. The gray is the road system. And then um, where it crisscrosses with the green, we would have ecological, bridge, uh, ecological bridges and ecological undercrafts and the water system is uh, goes underneath. And then this is the human society systems and the different um, activity zones. Now next would be ecosystem hydrology. And um, for this project, this is the, uh, the water reticulation system, but the, the uh, white squares show the detention ponds where the water is brought back into the ground. And so, um, the whole idea was that we try and close the loop as much as we can within the built environment. And then anything that we, 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 we cannot recently reuse and recycle, we bring it back into the ground through a number of, you know, of bass rails, through uh, paving, through, you know, uh, rain gardens and so forth. And so this is the, if you like, the cyclic system and therefore the black water or the sea, which we should have a constructed wetland where, has this, where we have a series of ponds so that the uh, black water flows from one pond to another pond, to the other pond, to the final pond. So in the process, it is, um, it is cleaned, it, it is uh, fil filtered so that when the water reaches the final pond, uh, it should be almost potable. Uh, the fourth characteristic that we should try and uh, em emulate is ecosystems responsive to responsiveness to climate. Now, the world consists of a, a number of climatic zones and that determines the ecology of that location. And the ecosystems respond to that, uh, to the climate. And this affects, uh, determines the species of fauna, species of flora, determines the soil, determines the uh, seasons, of these particular particular localities, so the ecosystems respond, you know, to, to the climate. Now, what we have in a cold climate, as you as where you are in the UK, is that you have a cold winter and you have a hot summer, and that's indicated by this dotted line, uh, which is the the blue dotted line. The red line is a straight line. This is what engineers uh, do, uh, want us to, to, to have. They want to have consistent temperature throughout the whole year, consistent air change, consistent you know, um, uh, condi you know, internal conditions. And this is a high energy solution. 
And so uh, what we should try and do is to try and optimize um, um, passive mode design, which is designing with the climate locality. And so as you can see, you have a winter and a summer. These are two extreme seasons. You have the mid seasons, uh, which are you know, nice, uh, a nice uh, time of the year. And so um, the full mode uh, is the, the red line. And at the moment it uses mostly non-renewable energy and that, that makes it a high energy situation. But through designing with climate, as you can see some of the strategies that you can see the right hand side, a proper shaping the built form um, by orientation, by facade design, by optimizing ambient energies and so forth. Um, we're able to improve the comfort conditions a little bit. So that is the white line that you see there. And that, um, but we should not delude ourselves that passive mode design or, or biochromatic design can ever equal that red line. We can never achieve the red line. And so the next stage then would be, what happens if we use partial mechanical electrical systems? So I call this mix mode, which is this dotted line. So we improve a little bit further. And ideally we should use, the last would be what I call full, you know, productive mode where we use renewable energy, but we should try and get as close as we can. But it, in practice, it doesn't need to be 100% consistent throughout the whole year. You can vary a little bit. In winter, we can wear warmer clothes. In summer, we can, you know, we can, I'm not saying we're going to go around stockers, but you know, you can wear less clothes and wear lighter clothing in the summer. And so productive mode is that um, dotted line on the right hand side where we use renewable energy, solar energy, uh, tidal energy, and wind energy. And so if you like, this is, uh, this is you know, how we can design um, you know, for low energy, um, nearing towards net zero energy um, in our built environment. Now, in London, we did the extension to the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. And the idea was to use natural ventilation to extend the mid-season as much as possible. Extend mid-season into winter so that it reduces the period for, for cooling or for heating winter. Experiment extend the mid-season uh, mid into the summer through the use of natural ventilation. And so uh, here, um, this is the, uh, oh, sorry, I, I got a little extra slides. got mixed up a bit. What happened here, I'm not sure. So I see, did you change my slides? No. Huh? No. I don't know what's happened here. Anyway, um, the building that we did, um, with mixed mode is um, well. This is in uh, this is the uh, the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital extension, and uh, as I mentioned, we should try and in, extend the mid seasons, and that the extended building is that that part of the existing hospital. And what we did was to put a flue wall in front of the building, and the lower three floors are the um, the coffee house and the lounges, uh, which is occupied by, um, operated by Walt Disney, because this is a children's hospital. And so you can see the, the flu that on the outside, which sucks the air from, from, from the bottom and from, through these floors, and, and, and that's a valve at the top of the building that lets the air out. And so this is the valve at the bottom of the building. And that, you know, that's the, uh, that is the uh, that is the uh, mixed mode system. Here's another building that we did in Beijing, which is um, you know a little bit above uh, London. It's about thirty plus degrees above the equator. This is in the Xiong'an district of Beijing, which is about forty minutes from Beijing itself. This location is a new capital city for for, for Beijing, and that uh, it is a renovation to the existing building. So this is the existing building. What we did was to create you know, a number, punch a number of holes in the facade of the building so that it goes up into the central atrium. And so these are operated by adjustable you know, panels and, 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 and vents. 
you know, so to, to, to bring the natural ventilation to the inner parts of the building. This is the master plan of the site. And um, besides doing this, we started to look at experiments into how we can locate the core positions uh, in a high rise tower. And from a whole series of uh, core positions, central core, uh, tilted floor plate, uh, reconfigured, reorientated floor plates, course at the both ends of the building on the east and west side. The conclusion from these studies is that the core on the east and west side um, make, gives the building the lowest consumption of energy. So this is this tower that we did. You can see the, you know, the elevator core on one side and the other core on the other side. And the uh, solar path is the one on the, uh, on, on the, in the middle there. This building. This was completed back in 1986, so this is quite an old building. But one of the ideas I had was the, was the idea that you know building should actually have a canopy on top of it, just like an umbrella. An umbrella actually is a very cybernetic device because depending on the direction of the wind and the rain and the snow, uh, uh, um, you can actually tilt the umbrella to keep out the sun, to keep out the rain, keep out the wind depending on the conditions you want. And so this is my, if you like my golden chalice, to do a building with an adjustable canopy that automatically changes and adjusts itself uh, depending on the seasons of the year. And so these are different canopy designs that we did. This can be over a station. Uh, this, is the, this is a master plan for a university in a competition that we won. And this is the university hub where we took the fritted glass pattern again, we put it horizontally, so it becomes, uh, you know, um, becomes a, a, a canopy over the university hub. And it's what the uh, canopy looks like. Um, this is a canopy for the Xiong An station, which uh, is not built. Um, and uh, it, again, it is located about, you know, 40 minutes from Beijing. Um, this is the master plan for, for, these, uh, for the station. And this is the low floor showing the greenery that connects up to the roof of the building. This is a building that we did back in 1985. And we started to explore uh, the idea of a louvered canopy where it lets in the morning sun, keeps out the afternoon, the midday and the afternoon sun. And so this is the, on the Eastern side, you can see it's shaped to let in the morning sun. And you look at the, the cross section, it keeps out the afternoon sun and the hot, the hot, no, midday sun and the afternoon sun. And the whole idea was that the swimming pool then becomes an evaporative cooling device that brings cool air into the top upper parts of the building. This is the plan of the building. It is, um, has, it has, it is perforated, if you like, you know, north and south and east and west. And this is the um, passageway through from the entrance of the building. This is a staircase to take you up to the top of the building. And then we discover, you know, little ideas such as the wing, you know, the wing wall where it deflects the, the wind from the southwest, from the southern part of the wing into the inner parts of the building. But if you look in the floor plan, the, 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 the walls, if you like, are angled. This merges the insides of the building with the outside so that it, is, there's, it, it blurs the distinction between inside and outside. And so if you like, you know, the building becomes a series of indoor outdoor courtyards A and B and uh, you know and it was two other courtyards on the north and south. Uh, the building uses about 42 kilo hours per square meter per annum whereas an you know, average house uses about 60 and office building uses about 131. So and so this uh, the biochromatic design principles you know is effective in this building. But eventually the idea would be what happens if a building is 100% productive which is something we're working on now, where the, the glass wall would have, uh, the external wall would have embedded photovoltaics and solar cells. So the whole building itself becomes a power station and that it doesn't need to have electrical energy from outside sources. And so then the fourth part of the, the uh, eighth property is the cycling materials. It is more, if you like, a system of, of how we use materials, but it also affects the way we design the building, where the building should be designed for as DFD, designed for disassembly, so that the building components itself could be replaced and could be uh, reused 
um, and, and that is easy to disassemble. And so the idea was to close the loop as much as possible. The output is reused, recycled, and those that we cannot re reintegrate back into the biosphere in a seamless and benign way. Um, this is a diagram I've been working on. It's not 100% perfect, uh, where the energy from, from the, that you, the non renewable energy you take from the planet is, is used for different stages in the flow materials of extraction to processing, to manufacture, to distribution, to retail, to user, and then, and then, and then it is recycled back into different stages. And so, but this is something outside the scope of the architect is something that the city, the government, the utilities, you know, have to implement. And this, we're doing, you know, we're doing this in part where households start to separate the waste and so that you know it is for recycling, and certain parts of London are, are, are very effective in doing this. But we should extend this to not just the household waste, but also to the building itself and of its useful life. And so, in this list of ecosystem attributes, um, the last four I've not able to get round to those yet, and they are just pending my agenda of things have to do uh, in our research. And so now I'm going to end in a minute. Essentially, um, these are the four principles that I discussed. Ecocentricity as designing uh, based on the science of ecology, uh, integration of, of, of our buildings and, and systems together, both physically and systemically. Ecomimicry means emulating, replicating, and augmenting ecosystem properties. And the last one, infrastructure as a way of designing our, our, our master plans and built environment. Now, we're still a long way to go. Here's a, here's a lady with, um, with an artificial uh, prosthetic device, but it's early days. Can you imagine that at the moment it is just physical Inter, in, in, uh, integration. To some extent, you can connect it to the muscles in the body, but it, it is, we haven't been able to connect it to the nervous system and the other systems within the body because if we connect it and we puncture the, the human organism, then it, it is a, it's an open wound. It can become septic. It can, you know, we have all sorts of issues. And so even with prosthetic devices, we have a long way to go. And this is just to remind you of the of the ecosystems, but actually I've put a box around the human society, human community, because everything depends on us as human beings. Now let's say in the ideal world we got everything right. We de we designed the ideal perfect ecological building, where it integrates with nature. Uh, you know all the green, all the uh, built systems are recyclable, reused, and have minimal impact environment, and the waters you know has operates the closed cycle. But what happens if we as human beings, we don't behave, we don't, we don't respect nature, we continue to destroy nature. So at the end of the day, ecological design, it's not just architects and designers and engineers designing the best ecological buildings. The human society has to change, the lifestyle has to change, the food that it eats has to change, uh, and, and the way it uses the natural environment has to change. And so at the end of the day, we are one of the key factors ourselves as human beings in ecological design. Thank you.